Ruth? Ruth? Well, when did you decipher? At exactly 0400. Let's have it. It's just three words. I didn't ask for a word count. Give me the message. You won't believe it. We've checked and double checked. It keeps coming up the same thing. Colonel, the message is Mars needs women. You're it. I'm it. Since you want to limit the press, you give me the handouts. I'll feed the news pool. I trust we won't disappoint them. I'll see to it that you get everything short of classified information. And anything, quote, in the national interest? I don't have to be reminded of the ground rules, Stemmons. Well, then, Colonel, maybe we can start with this question. Just how long have we been receiving these mysterious signals from outer space? Three days. Do we know from where or from whom they're coming? We do not. Well, here's the $64 million question. Now, we know you wouldn't have come down here at this hour after all the sleep you've lost in the last three days if the message had not been decoded. What is the message? 
That information will have to be given to you from another level. From the president? Did you cut me off? I'm sorry to trouble you at this hour, Mr. Secretary. Quite all right. Uh, where are we, Bob? The code is broken. Trouble? Big. Security? I have the lid on tight. Well, take it off for me. The message is, Mars needs women. Mars needs... <laughs> it's a gag. It's a prank. It's a fake. I don't think so, sir. As you're well aware, we've been receiving these signals for the past three days now. It's progressively stronger and always the same rhythmic log. Now, the patterns we have broken are distinct and repetitive. And the readout has been confirmed by the 8600 transponder. The final message? Just those three words? Well, I know it's crazy. It could be a password. It's not a distress signal. Its intermittence is perfect. I... I'm going to have to relay the message to the president on the hotline. Oh, uh, about the press, sir. They voted on Stemmons to feed the pool. You know what that means. Now, we'll risk panic if we give out too much information. Well, we'll guarantee panic if we don't give out enough. So, open up. Our story can be that this is nothing more than a freakish malfunction of a highly sophisticated global comms system. That'll be all. I'll take it from here, Bob. Yes, sir. Mr. President? The rhythmic log changed while you were in the solo room. They're going to communicate. Communicate? They have a condition. We must agree to shut down everything that scans. Only radio can stay hot. Ultimatums. Ultimatums from an enemy we haven't even seen yet. Sir, how can we be sure it is an enemy? Let's go. Transponders. Doppler relays. Attention, Monitor One. Do you read us? Reading loud and clear. We have attempted to seize three women by transponder. We have been unsuccessful. Now we come in person. Prepare for materialization. What do you mean, materialization? Forgive me. I forget the scientific distances that separate us. In the center of the room, please, all Earth men clear for a space of three yards. I will join you as soon as it is clear. You reach for me, you try and restrain me, and just as I materialize, so I will disappear. Everyone back. Don't try anything. My name is Dop. I come from Canali Primary, debarkation red planet Mars. We have been spaceborne for 70 days, and we have maintained a constant of 25,000 miles per hour. We have asked you to neutralize all scans that may locate us or determine our silhouette. We have complied. Now you must disclose your mission. We come not as hostiles. We are medical missionaries. A critical recession in the Y chromosomes in our genetics has resulted in a preponderance of male births over female. The ratio is now 100 to 1. Advanced techniques have failed to solve this problem. Therefore, we have come these 50 million miles to your Earth. Will you define your mission? Ours is an experimental voyage. Our craft is small, a crew of five, but with room for five more passengers to return to Mars. We seek female volunteers, unmarried, of good health, and possessing the common indicators of fertility and reproduction. Why, your subjection is insane. We are in earnest. The life of our planet depends upon this. Although we may sympathize with your problem, 
yours is still an overt action of abduction and war. We demand that you abort your mission and return to Mars. It is unfortunate that you do not choose to cooperate. Under the circumstances, I return to my ship to carry out our mission with or without your cooperation. In 30 seconds, we will begin radio silence. You will not hear from us again until our cargo is secured and we are well on our return to the planet Mars. Well, Stimmons, at least you've heard the story. Tell it. And at the United Nations in New York, our ambassador has called for an emergency meeting of the Security Council. He urged a cessation of all world conflicts so that we may unite to meet the threat from outer space. He called the Martians the world's first common enemy. Étant en séance réunis à New York, l'ambassadeur la convoqué à la conseillère de sécurité en session spéciale. Il n'est pas forcé avec vigueur on arrête et tranche les conflits mondiaux afin que nos passions nous unir pour affronter ensemble la menace éveillée de Mars. Mars. And here in Washington, the capital is stunned by the macabre situation. There is no panic, just paralysis, as the most powerful nation on Earth is humbled by five men in a space cylinder, hurtling toward the approximate vicinity of Houston, Texas. Short order to Cheetah. Short order to Cheetah. This is 15. This is They're sending up the X-15. Cheetah 15. Go ahead, short order. Now this latest from the Strategic Air Command Headquarters. Jets have been finally ordered aloft for interception. As you heard earlier, the command was reluctant to order any retaliatory maneuver or interception until there was positive identification of the visitors, or at least a silhouette. 
but the radar, rendered impotent by the Martians, has made this impossible. Obviously, this is a desperate hit or miss interception in which the command can hope for at least a visual sighting. neutralized everything that scans, but they've left us voice channels. Does that mean they can't knock out our big transmitters? Any intelligence that can neutralize our big dishes on the coast could certainly kill our voice. No, there's some other reason. But what, sir? Well, they're letting us keep our big voice, because voice can not determine their silhouette and locate them. And there's another reason. They can listen to us burn and enjoy their superiority all the more. What do we do now, sir? We do the only thing we can do. Wait. Wait, wait, Marvin. I believe I've got something. Look! Look! We better get out of here. We've both had too many. And don't you say a word about this to Clarine. She didn't say that red flare was a pink elephant. Thank you. 
our first concern is chemicals. We need brine, ammonia, salts, and sodium. The necessary chemicals are here. Uh, information was correct. This ice plant hasn't produced for years. Yes. Our scale model was quite accurate. Our timetable is plotted very carefully, so listen. Our 70 days in space have produced no apparent ill effects, but some warnings. Doctor? You've already noticed the change in surface gravity. You're twice as heavy as you were on Mars. You will tire quickly. So rest whenever possible. Choose your motions carefully. Since our tenure on Earth will be for only 24 hours, do not repeat. Do not eat any of the Earth food. You must continue your encapsulated diet from the tubes. What if there's resistance? Fellow three, this is a non-hostile mission. I see no reason for violence. If, however, you are confronted, you may resort to the use of hypnosis. Our immediate needs are Earth apparel, an automobile, Earth currency, and a map of the city and its environs. Fellow two, you and I will remain behind to check power lines and supplies and to see what must be done to make Operation Sleep Freeze a reality. Fellow three, currency and a city map are your assignments. The best place for this is a fuel stop which the Earthmen call filling stations. Fellow four, transportation is your responsibility. We cannot buy or rent a vehicle, so it must be borrowed. To take just any automobile would invite interference from the police. We must be sure that the lender will not miss the car for at least 24 hours. assignment is Earth Apparel. Now make your strike at the first shopping complex you come to. The locks on these doors are of the crude tri-tumbler design and should present no problem to you with the air knife. Remember, sizes must be exact from shoes to ties. But follow carefully the conversion charts between Mars and the Earth planet. These ties serve no functional purpose. Red Planet abandoned the use of ties 50 years ago as useless male vanity. It simply reveals the environmental naivete of the Earthmen. Well, apparently we've made our conversion to Earthmen with no ill effects. 
It's unfortunate that fellow three saw fit to disable the fuel station attendant. My action was dictated by expediency. Well, we'll hope that it will be dismissed as part of the juvenile crime wave that grips Earth cities. You've been well rehearsed in every conceivable situation you will encounter as Earthmen, even to the use of Earth slang, and you are now, for all practical purposes, Earthmen. Doctor? Our time is short, considering that in the next 20 hours, each of us must survey, choose, examine the medical records of, and abduct a female meeting the exacting qualifications of Operation Sleep Freeze. Since the Earthmen, especially the Americans, seem to place their faith in luck rather than scientific certainties, I wish you all luck. Having to maintain the snail's pace is very frustrating. I know, but we can't risk being stopped by the police.
Have a large double room, please. Yes, have your reservation? No. I'm sorry. It's out of the question. We're completely booked. It's this Martian scare. Every newspaper man in the country must be here. <laughs> it's bad enough when we have a space shoot. But with all this talk about the Martians coming to take us girls, <laughs> the limit. I guess they have to sell their newspapers. They have to sell newspapers, and you, you have to sell rooms. Huh? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you could wait upstairs in the bar, and if we have a cancellation, we can call you. I'll be very good at the uh -huh. What was that name? Two martinis, please. How long have you been in Texas, mister? Oh, you must be one of those reporter fellas. You can't get a mixed drink here in Texas. Beer or wine? Two beers, please. Two beers. And a spokesman from Monitor One, the United States Surveillance Center, confirmed the fact that top military and cabinet officers have been summoned to the center from Washington. After meeting nothing but big brass and tight-lipped politicians all day, reporters had a pleasant surprise when one expert jetted into Houston's International Airport. Dr. Marjorie Bolin turned out to be a stunning brunette who found it hard to hide her charm behind her horn-rimmed spectacles. Dr. Bolin wrote her thesis on space medicine and received a Pulitzer Prize for her book, Space Genetics. Dr. Bolin will be part of a high-level meeting scheduled at Monitor One for tomorrow morning. A briefing for newsmen has been set for tonight at the Holiday Inn. That's network news for this hour. Bulletins will be issued when received. Stay tuned now for the sports picture. This promises to be an exciting weekend for the football fans, both in college games and pro games slated to be televised. Long ago when the world was very, very young In the spring when the first of the They didn't let it drop, those reporters. I was friends. I wonder. What? Uh, what if one of our candidates for Operation Sleep Breeze just happened to be well-versed in genetics, both fundamentally and as it applies to space? And? And she just happened to be blessed physically, too, anatomically speaking. I wonder if she's single. That can be confirmed. Just as her medical history can be determined by one long-distance call from me. Let's investigate. We'll, uh, we'll need a press card. And we've got to get a room at the base of operation. The others may be trying to contact us by radio. Come with me. I'm with the Houston Post. I'm expecting some reported friends of mine from the West Coast, a Mr. Ross and a Mr. Miller. The only recent arrivals from the West. Let's see, there's a Mr. A Mr. Fast from Seattle. He's with the Seattle Sun. Fast, that's it, yes. May I have his room number, please? 
Best checked into 303. 303. Thank you very much, operator. In exactly five minutes, go to room 303 and apologize to Mr. Fast for having rented him my room. You'll have to resort to the hypnotic state. Well, we don't have time for anything else. But what about when he comes out of hypnosis? I'll induce a post-hypnotic mode and send him back to Seattle. It's a long chance. Well, time is short. We have to take long chances. Five minutes. Previous occupant left behind a hat. I wonder if I could pick it oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Come right on in. Feel free just to look around. I'm sure it's around here someplace. I'm trying to get hold of the wife on the phone. It's very important. Go look around. Hello? Hello? Operator? Yes. This is Roger Fast. I'm, I'm trying to get hold of my wife on the phone in Seattle, and I talked to her I'm trying to talk to the operator. Mr. Fast? Heights? Heights? I don't follow you. Of course, we're only three stories high. But if you look down, you'll see that heights have their own power of persuasion. No, but really, Mr. It would take more than that. Persuasion, Mr. Fast. Persuasion. Suggestion. Making you want to do deeply. Do my will. And I will, Mr. Fast. You will do as I say. You will do my will. Well, yes. You are now in a hypnotic trance. You can help us, Mr. Fast, on this mission. First, give me your press card. In a moment, you will wake up, but you will be in a post-hypnotic state for 24 hours. You will discover that you have lost your press card and you will go back to Seattle. Back to Seattle. And there you will be able to conduct your business as though nothing had happened, as though this had never transpired. Yes. And when I snap my fingers, you will leave the first level of hypnosis, but you will remain in a post-hypnotic state. Yes, it is a lovely view. I'm very sorry, Mr. Fast, about the mix-up. No, no, no problem at all. It's all my mistake all the way around. Funny. What seems to be the problem? I seem to have misplaced my press card. Sorry about that. Oh, no sweat. I probably left it on the dresser at home. I, I won't need it anyway. <laughs> that is, unless you know some out of the way place. <laughs> mm. No, I guess you wouldn't. Hold up. Get my suitcase. Green. Condition 
Jimmy Green. Intermittent. He reads us, but doesn't think it's safe to send. Let's go to four. Calling Red Planet Top Com. We read you. Four. Signal is weak. Advise. Signal dissipated because I'm in phone housing airport. Is there a progress report? Report yellow. Several subjects rejected. Now have excellent lead under surveillance. Does the new subject conform to basic specifications? The subject meets physical specs, at least superficially. What about marital? Can you be sure of status? At this point, I can only be as sure as the airline that hired her. Understood. Keep subject under surveillance. I'll... Two down, one to go. Malfunction? No, the signal is circuited. Then he's either not responding or he can't hear us. This is Mr. Fast at 303. Would you please tell me where Dr. Boland's news conference is taking place? Thank you, operator. Would you like to see my subject close up? No, I've got my own subject to find. Your subjects are night people, but co-eds are early risers. I want to be on the campus at sunup. This double weight I've been carrying has tired me. You know, I'd better turn in. No, this is Dr. Boland who treats me. Yeah. With her knowledge of both Earth and uh, extraterrestrial medicine, she would be the most valuable cargo we could take to Mars. Good night. Good night. I guess this Martian scare was another joke we fell for, huh? Uh, we weren't sure for a while, though, were we? 
Just like those flying saucers. Why, now, we really fell for that one, didn't we? <laughs> It sure did, you know. It, it takes me back to that radio show years ago. Let's see, what was it? Uh, uh, invasion from Mars, something like that. Remember? No, that's before your time. Yeah, you know, it was about 30 years ago. Yeah, darndest thing you ever heard of. Why, people were fainting all over the country. <laughs> you know, there was even a heart attack or two because of it. Imagine, with our rockets and space programs and all, that we should let some practical joker get on our defense system and just scare the daylights out of us. <laughs> Do you think they're going to catch the prankster that did this? You know, I just wonder what the guy's feeling like right now. You know, getting us all stirred up and spending all that money and sending up those planes. Well, the girls they take to Mars are going to have it great, won't they, Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> 100 men to every woman. Just like Washington during WW2, remember? <laughs> no, it's the other way around, wasn't it, fellas? 20 girls to every man. <laughs> Gentlemen, I met some students who are seriously trying to find out about themselves and their environment and came here at the request of my government because I thought I could be of some service. I agreed to this interview because my special interest in education should throw some light on what's happening. Now, obviously, you think it's a big joke. Unless someone can come up with a pertinent question relating to the emergency that exists, this interview is over. Dr. Bolin. Yes. Fast. Seattle Sun. There's been a lot of talk about breaking the code. The new discoveries regarding the structure of the DNA molecule and the non-chromosomal factors involved in genetics. Doesn't this suggest that what happened on Mars could happen here? Well, it looks like at least one newspaper sent a medical reporter instead of ambulance chasers. That's correct, Mr. Fass. The public is not yet fully informed on DNA and our attempts to break the genetic code. However, experiments with white mice mutations have thrown a new light on the dominant or recessive natures of these mutants. At least enough to establish a possibility of an imbalance in the ratio of birth. Then you're saying these Martians, if they exist, could be mutants, uh, odd-looking creatures like something out of a science fiction movie? <laughs> no, Mr. Stemmons. It's just that no real insight into genetics is possible without an understanding of mutation. Now, it's very presumptuous of us to believe that Martians are going to be any different than we are. It's merely a freak in their genetic code that has brought them to this planet. And I'm sure they don't plan to harm us. At least not yet. And now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must prepare for Monitor One meeting tomorrow. Simmons, USP. Fast. Seattle Sun. Say, you know, you made a monkey out of these guys. I'm afraid they can't take it all too seriously. How about you? I think it's a strange vanity that makes us think we're the only ones in the solar system. You know, you make a lot of sense. Say, I'm in charge of pool info out of Monitor One. I'm sure I could arrange to have you help me in the booth. After all, I could use an interpreter. It would be a pleasure. Good. Let's see you at Monitor One. Thank you, Mr. Fass. For what? For keeping this session from becoming completely useless. Boy, after my flight and a million jokes about sex in space, I just feel but like... You're I... pushed. <laughs> yes, that's the word for it. Oh, please. I, I didn't mean for you to go. Aren't you tired? Emotionally, yes, but I don't think I could sleep a wink now if I tried. You know what I'd really like to do? I'm not very good at guessing. That's right, the scientific mind, facts only. Because I'm really deep down like those reporters out there. I just can't believe we have visitors from Mars. Right now, I'd like to be as far away from scientific thinking as possible, in the most unlikely atmosphere.
Welcome to the planetarium. Won't you come in and be seated? It looks as if you're the only two that will be taking this trip to Mars today. I think I spoke too soon. Attention, attention, rocket control to spaceship. All systems are in readiness for blast off. Are you ready? Ready! All preparations for our trip to Mars have been completed and we are counting. Seven, six, five. and we are well established into main stage. Our thrust is building up to its full value of 396 tons. We are leaving Earth very rapidly now and will soon be traveling at the rate of 25,000 miles per hour. We are now 12 days out. According to our flight path prediction, you may be able to see a sight never before seen by human eye, a transit of the Earth and the Moon across the flaming surface of the Sun. This transit is important for our voyage to Mars because the timing of these objects across the sun's surface will indicate any corrective thrust maneuver that must be made. This is necessary for our expedition to meet Mars at the appointed rendezvous point. Mars. This large multicolored disk with its red, white, and green shadings is Mars, the one planet that shows evidence. evidence of being habitable. Its distance from the Earth varies from between 65 and 35 million miles. It's about half the size of Earth. If you'll notice, Mars has polar caps over the North and South Poles. Between those polar caps is one of the biggest controversies about Mars the crisscrossing of a network of canals that is geometrically perfect. Many believe that these canals are used as part of a vast irrigation system by which water, which is rare on Mars, is pumped from the polar caps to supply the needs of the rest of the planet. Temperature varies from between minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, except on the plain of Silator, where it gets even warmer. The red color of Mars indicates that most of the oxygen has been eaten up in rusting and oxidizing the rocks on the surface. Yes, the conditions for life do exist on Mars. But unless somehow it can renew itself, the first Earth explorers will find only the sad remnants of a civilization was brighter than that of the Earth. And then returned to dust. Goodbye. Goodbye, We are indebted to you, sir. I'm surprised that our tape deck held up as long as it did without jamming. You know, ever since this Martian scare, the planetarium has been filled to capacity. It is my pleasure. You know, folks 
really want to believe that the Martians are coming. They're bored. They want some excitement. And after all, they come here because this is the closest thing that they can get to actually being on the planet Mars. Well, I hope you don't have any more trouble. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, goodbye. Uh, and come to see us again, will you? I'm afraid a little of their enthusiasm has rubbed off on me. I don't really feel like going back to the hotel now. When was the last time you took a pretty girl for a walk? I mean a pretty girl with a PhD. We've known one another less than five hours. Please, Dr. Einstein's calculation. Time, Time is relative. <laughs> Well, I can't dismiss what's happening to me with any scientific equation. I think I'd better start acting less like a woman and more like a scientist. I'm unsure I'll ground that way. You're late. I think you're
finalists have been under the eyes of the judges who are basing their selection today on those qualities that make up the ideal woman. Good looks, good health, good deportment, and personality. In short, the good woman as we know her in the 20th century. One of these lovelies will carry her honors and her crown throughout the year on campus as that student who most approaches the perfect woman as chosen by, first, the student body, and then by the exacting eye of the judges panel today. I believe I hear a gun signaling the judges have reached a decision. And now, ladies and gentlemen, homecoming queen by a majority of the judges, Brenda Noah, senior. There you have it, the queen, Brenda Nolan, a really popular girl on campus. As you heard, she is a senior. Her major is journalism, and she looks for a career in mass media communication. Although some lucky young man may change those plans for the time being, she is queen on campus and the pride of her sorority, Delta Gamma. Hypnosis, Mr. Secretary. Hypnosis, that science that we only now are beginning to use properly. The Martians have got to be using hypnosis. The striptease artist. We dismiss that as a routine missing persons report. But remember, her car is missing too. Then the airline hostess. And today, the homecoming queen disappears. And don't forget the Martian's voice, as you gentlemen described it. It had an hypnotic cadence that makes it very difficult to disobey. But let's not speculate. Let us use logic. So far, the pattern of activity has been erratic. But soon we will have a pattern that will give us a lead. At any rate, we are dealing with an enemy that professes non-hostility while abducting Earth's females. We are helpless because he has mastered a science that we still treat as a parlor game. One thing we can be sure of, he is working against time, and he will stop at nothing to achieve his goal before his time runs out. Yes, it's true. The worst fears of the experts here at Monitor One have been confirmed. What seemed like a cruel joke yesterday has now been confirmed as the truth. In less than 12 hours, three women, all beautiful and all unmarried, have disappeared, leaving no trace of what may have happened to them. The experts in space genetics and space communications have been in conference here all day without so much as a coffee break. One thing we do know about the victims, they have to be pretty special to qualify.
is an old painter's trick. White paint. You just put a few dabs of the paint onto the canvas here. Like that. And stick the paper to the paint. Somehow white works best, and there's no paint out problem when you go to use the canvas. Well, I'll remember that. <laughs> Trees. Funny. Trees are the most difficult things in the world to paint properly. Yet, children always start with trees. That's right, they do. Trees do have a fascination. If you stare at the sun through the leaves of the trees, you get an almost hypnotic sensation. I never thought about it. Never thought about it. Painting and hypnosis. Number four, all lovely, built like goddesses and unmet. One more to go. Now, there's got to be a pattern here somewhere, a clue. Now, the blue pens are where the strikes were first made, the filling station, the clothing store, and the red pens are where the girls disappeared. If we draw our primary peripheries, we find that the action surrounds this area, principally made up of a big lake just east of the city. Now, there's nothing here but abandoned wharves, an old ice factory, and a large generating plant. Pardon me, Colonel. You said an old ice factory? Yes. How long has that been inoperative? Well, the city condemned it years ago. Could there be a chemical inventory there now? Well, yes, there could be. Ammonia, salts, brine. Dr. Hayward. Well, if I recall, it's just as it was. It was padlocked back when we had the controversy over the fluoridation of the city water supply. Then that could be your target. Explain your theory. Most of you are familiar with the term sleep freeze. Labs are now conducting experiments in the new science of frozen surgery in transplants, in operations that have to be postponed for a period of time. It's literally suspended life through frozen techniques. Now, more than one authority has suggested that our first interplanetary travel will be done in a state of sleep and frozen, hence the term sleep freeze. If these techniques are perfected, man can be thrust through space never knowing the ill effects of space travel or the boredom from being confined in a closed vehicle over a long period of time. Dr. Bolin is right. But may I ask you, how do you happen to be familiar with sleep freeze? Freezing is the key in our latest mapping techniques with non-chromosomal genes. I'm no scientist, but as a soldier, I feel I'm on safer ground when I know where the enemy is. And I think we just may have found him. Something's up. They haven't been this positive since the alert began. Now they've cut everything. Must mean they're getting somewhere. It must be something Dr. Bolin has said. If I remember correctly, there's a water canal that enters the ice plant. Large enough for a vehicle of some kind to enter? Within reason, yes. I've cut the nose arteries. Now each of you must regard our plan as top secret. Now, we can't make a raid with a large party or during the daylight hours. Now, since I feel that their departure is scheduled for after dark, we can risk waiting until then. However, after sundown, every second is precious. Dr. Bolin is in on this. Fast, this is an important story. I want you to get her confidence. I must. evening? Just being with you is enough. You hungry? No, not really. Are you? Not really. I, I had a, a late lunch while you were in that inner circle. How did, how did you ever become an authority on genetics? I grew up with it. My father devoted his entire life to that field. 
Then, after he died, it seemed only natural for me to continue his work. He must be very proud of you winning the Pulitzer Prize. He made it all possible. Would you like to meet my father? Yes. I am the talking woman. As you walk about these corridors, you will see some of the outstanding illustrations of the work of the late Dr. Gustav Bolin, the renowned authority on genetics in the 20th century. Today, the theories and discoveries of this renowned scientist are explored in health museums like this one all over the country. Dr. Bolin's credo is found in the words of Alexander Pope. Know thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Do you agree that the study of mankind is man? A woman. What time is it? I kid you and your only response is what time is it? It's 8.02. A late date? Of course not. I have a mission. I'm on an assignment, remember? This time tomorrow night, you'll be safe and snug in Seattle, and I may never see you again. Tomorrow? What's, what do you mean, tomorrow? We think we've found the Martian's hideout, and, and there's going to be a raid on it tonight. Why didn't you say something before? I'm sworn to secrecy. I'm not allowed to say where. No, I know where. When? At 9 o'clock. You don't go with me. The exotic dancer is secured. Pulse is high. Temperature? Pulse normal. Sedative is at zenith. Blood pressure at zenith. Temperature 99.4. Pulse? Sedative at zenith. Blood pressure 118.78. Pulse Blood normal. Dilation reduced. Right. Blood pressure 125. Sedative at zenith. Temperature is 99.1. Pulse high. Blood pressure 122 over 82. Dilation. There's no some high. fibrillation. Abort the mission. We've been concerned for you, fellow one. There's no time for concern. There's a raiding party on the way. They're due here any minute. Abort! Take to the ship! Fellow one, you? Please leave before they arrive. Nobody leaves this room. 
What happens if you go without the women? There's no time to complete preparations of the subjects. They'll have reinforcements soon. I'm not coming with you, fellow two. To abort this mission is failure enough. To leave you behind would mean death to us all. Why not take both of them? We could freeze her en route. As a test case for insemination? You must make a decision. One of you goes. Dr. Bolin would compensate for the aborted mission. One good subject. But if you decide to go, I don't have to remind you of the consequences of your actions or of abandoning your mission. You must decide now. vocabulary a hundred years ago. But whatever love is, I know it must be what I feel for you. shortly with no ill effects. Will you be able to describe them? Well, can't you tell us anything? <laughs> 